Great friends on a Monday afternoon. Tuesday. No, Tuesday. Ah. Uh. On day, I don't know, of the California quarantine. 70. Day 70. Oh. Although I'm going to tell you right now, I'm declaring this thing over, and I'll tell you why in a second. <laughs> and that would make this episode what of the podcast? 205. All things I should probably consider before we actually take to the airwaves. But what happens is, and I've told you guys this before, and there's no secrets in this thing, you know, we will get together and we'll piece things together. So coming up today, the creator of the HBO hit series Entourage, Doug Ellen, is going to be with us. So we've already recorded that conversation with Doug. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling loose. I'm feeling all warmed up. You know, we're coming on right now, but I've been on for the last hour. So these are things I probably should have asked for, which is what is the date? <laughs> what day of the week is it? What number episode of the podcast is it? And what day of the quarantine is it? So good afternoon, everybody. I feel like today's Monday, but it's Tuesday. And as Alex says, day 70 and episode 20 what? Five. Thank you. Grande, I'd like to say hello to you and start with you, but I'm looking at this young man right here, Big Brown, John Browner, mm -hmm. South Side of Chicago representing Browner. We did not see you on Friday because you sent us this text message, scared the ever living hell out of both of us. And you had to bail on the podcast on Friday because the baby was apparently in the hospital. Let's, 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 let's say this. Let's say this. Go ahead. I had some uh, some personal issues. Give yourself I, some some less headspace, by the way, real quick. It still got... See, I thought I had fixed that. Is that better? My hat's a little crooked. All right, keep going. Keep going. What were you I, saying? I had some personal uh, family issues mm -hmm. that I had to attend to. Oh, am I not supposed to say details that, on there? Yeah, no, no. See, that, this is uh, what I was trying to ask that required, before we went on. Oh, that, sorry. that required immediate attention, and that mm -hmm. may not uh, be resolved yet. And so I don't You guys want, want me to, to start all over, and I'll... I'll, I'll no, we'll, we'll no, 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 no. I will edit this out for you, even though we never <laughs> edit anything. No, no, no. There's no need to do that. Uh, they're, they're just not figured out until they get figured out. I don't want to say anything. What I will say is this. I appreciate everyone, uh, messaging me and, 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 uh, sending me prayers and, and thoughts. I really appreciate that. Uh, it's a, it's an interesting time to be in, uh, when you have children. So, uh, it's, I, hopefully everything is, I'll find out this week. Hopefully everything will be fine. Oh, okay. Well, listen, I didn't know any of this before we came on. And um, Alex, before we even did this Doug Ellen interview, which is coming up, Alex had said to John, hey, how you doing? How's everything going? And I was like, hold on, save it for the air. And then Alex is giving me shit. He's like, you're a dick. I want to have a f conversation with my friend. I didn't say you were like, a dick. Well, you did. <laughs> but it's okay. And I was, I just didn't, we, we were all out of sorts. I just didn't know. So here's the thing. Um, I didn't know if you didn't want me to share information with everybody. And I didn't really have a whole lot of information, but I do think I may have said on Friday that something was up with the baby. So I listen, all I can say is this, hope everything's great. And, um, and I, you know, I do know that we mentioned it. So I'm sure you got a lot of, a lot of people, you know, coming at you, you know? Yeah. Shout out to everybody who, uh, with the well, wishes, man, children complicated. <laughs> they are complicated. complicated and you never know man especially when they're babies you just never know you're like yeah they're fine you know and maybe they're not fine necessarily what do we know alex how are you after a weekend where you told me yesterday yeah. i'm going off the grid dude don't bother me today <laughs> i'm going off the grid yeah well uh i just was like i'm i'm kind of over being in front of my laptop and i'm just not going to do it today that's basically my my text to you is like if you need something hit me up on tomorrow that's the way I, I felt. And uh, I ended up wasting my day by downloading Madden 20 because it was on sale on the Xbox store for $17 yesterday. So I got Madden and I played it all day. And How much? $17. Oh, is that's that good? still too much for me. That's still oh, too much. Good? That, no, that's, that, that's still too much. Mm -hmm. That's still too much. Because another one comes out in August. I don't want to buy Madden 20. And then Madden 21 comes out in August. And it's, yeah. and, and it's out. So does, yeah, does, I, Madden, does Madden 20 have coronavirus and like Madden 21 already has a vaccine? What you tell me? Uh, no, uh, they just do release a Madden every single year and I won't be, I haven't bought Madden in like eight years, so I'm not going to worry me, about yeah. it. Yeah. So I was like, Oh, 17 bucks. I have room on my Xbox. I downloaded it. I played it. And then I realized 
oh yeah, I don't really like this game that much. So. <laughs> well, let me give you. I had my, I had Matt nineteen. I had yeah. Matt nineteen, and it it was trash, man. I literally went, yeah, I'm over this. I'm done. Yeah, I don't play any of these games. So, all right, um, I'm going to give you an opening thought here, just to get things kicked off. And here it is. I'm convinced that the world that I live in has determined, organically speaking, that the quarantine is over. Now, I want to I want to clarify what I'm saying to you. I personally have made this decision. I'm going to keep quarantined. I'm going to keep cautious. Um, I'm going to live, but, <laughs> but I'm going to be, but I'm going to try and still keep this, my actions under control. But here's what happened. So on Friday of last week, we were saying, Hey, well, all the restaurants are opening up, you know? And I said, well, I'm going to go, mm -hmm. I'm going to go with no gloves. I'm going to go with no mask. I'm going to go with my girlfriend. I'm going to a restaurant. You're baby. not that tough. You're not I'm that going tough. out. I'm going out. Wait, man. let him tell a story. I already have a conspiracy theory. I'm going out, okay? <laughs> and ultimately, I will tell you that we didn't go out. Um, <laughs> keyword, keyword, we. Yeah, yeah, but but what I mean by we didn't go out is we didn't go by what what our original plan was. I was going to go into Del Mar. I was going to go to a, a restaurant that my friend owns that I wanted to to you know be there and be supportive. And I just I didn't go. Um, and I just feel like over the course of the weekend, when I walked into places, um, or here, a better example, I walked the beach. You know, I love to go walking on the beach, right? So I walk from my house, I walk down to the beach, you know, mile, whatever it is, and then, and then I walk up and down the beach, right? And I'm telling you guys right now, no bullshit, I fucking watch this myself. One in 100 people were wearing masks. Yep. One in 100. In fact... If you were wearing a mask this weekend in Solana Beach where I was walking, they look at you weird. You were getting you're the, the weirdo. You're getting the look for me. Like, what the hell's wrong with you, man? Why you're you got a weirdo. why you got a mask on? Why you got a mask on? I'll tell you this. Yesterday, I received an invitation from a pal of mine, and he said, Hey, um, Charlie Hoffman and Xander Shaf Lee are playing golf to raise money for COVID related charities. This is the day after the match with Tom Brady and Peyton Manning and Tiger and Phil. I'll talk about that in a second. So I get this call and he says, Hey, um, Charlie and Xander are playing and we can follow them. And I made a donation. So we're going to do it. So I go over to this golf club and you're watching PGA tour pros standing there. You're on the, on the, 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 the tee box. You're in the fairway. You talk about hearing them. I mean, we're all standing there talking. You're on the green with these guys watching them read the putts and everything else. Okay. And so, um, so I went over there. I went to this country club yesterday and I'm telling you right now, this place is packed. Okay. Dude. And there are nobody wearing mm. masks. And I say nobody like the, the head pro, the people who were working there, anybody who was working responsible, wearing a mask, had it. Anybody who was there, who's a member or who's, uh, who's there having fun, the rest of us. And I say us, me, me too. Dude, we, none of us were wearing masks. None, none of us. And, and we weren't on top of each other. I mean, we were socially distancing. I, I'll, I'll give you that. But, but I, what I'm trying to say to you is this, and tell me if you guys have a different experience. And everybody who's in our YouTube chat right now, let me know if you have a different experience. Everybody who's in our Facebook chat who's watching right now, listening right now, I want to hear about your experience. For those of you that are listening on podcasts and you're doing it on your own time, so be it. But I want to get your, your experience, which is, I experienced a world this weekend where maybe these people haven't watched the news in the last two months. Okay. Um, nobody. And I'm just asking, we're on day 70 of the quarantine. I'm thinking to myself, I'm still here. Alex is still there. Browner is still there. Our guest today, Doug Ellen is at his place. He's not on the phone. I mean, it, it's still new world zooming. The whole world is zooming. Did, did I live a, a, an experience that no one else lived? Or did you notice maskless, gloveless human beings out in the world? Grande. I'm, I'm not going to uh, rat any specific places out because I feel like El Prez got shut down. And I feel a little bit responsible for that. But anyways, you weren't here on Friday, Oof. Browner. I ratted them out. Um, Can you just reset that for anybody that's watching right now, listening right now, that wasn't here on Friday? Alex, what did you say about this bar L present PB? Well, there was a, a lot of uh, Snapchat stories, Instagram posts, Twitter posts of, of just El Prez packed as hell on Thursday night. 
just up the walls, people, no one wearing masks, everyone touching shoulders. And I put it on the show, like, what is he doing? I took, what is he doing since you weren't here, JV? And I saw uh, that. And I was like, dude, come on, man. What are y'all doing? And then they ended up shutting it down that afternoon. Um, but see, what is you doing has power, Alex. <laughs> and I will say this, and you make you bring up a good point. And now, technically, dude, we are no longer in quarantine. The stay at home order is done. I think day 70 never even got here. I think on Friday, <laughs> day 67 was it because restaurants are open, which means you don't have to stay home. You can go to restaurants. I technically think that we are wrong right now. Technically, like there is no stay at home order anymore if you can go to restaurants and establishments that are open. So I think I got to take out the sign on the top corner right now. Okay. And by the way, listen, it's not just you. I've spent the whole weekend still communicating with Bill Hagen, who's here in our YouTube chat. This is the guy who now is going to put 1090 back on the air. In fact, today I just got tweeted. I, yeah, I just hear a bunch of people tweeting me now that 4th of July, which I want to say is a Saturday, yeah. is when 1090 goes back on the air. Maybe it will go on the air Saturday, Sunday, and then maybe we'll take to the air on Monday. We'll see how this all plays out over the next month and change. But um, Bill was telling me that his office, his advertising agency office is open. Uh, in talking to Doug Ellen, coming up in a matter of moments, the guy who is the creator of Entourage, Doug is telling us the story that he and a couple of his Entourage-related pals are getting together today to interview Gary Busey, the actor, which should be completely off the wall. And I'll watch and listen to that podcast as soon as they tell me where I can go to get it. Um, but they're getting together. What, what, when are we getting back together? That was one of my first thoughts today is like, when are we getting back together? Cause I'm telling you right now, the whole studio here is a shit show. Lights need to be replaced. Cameras need to be mounted. Guests need to come back in. When is the show getting back together? If the quarantine orders are over. Dude, I will tell you what I saw this weekend. It was terrifying what I saw on television. What I saw in person was, was, <laughs> was, was enjoyable. I was happy to drive through uh, Adams Avenue and 30th Street and North Park and see businesses open. Um, watch Driving up those streets and seeing nothing active kind of put me in a very dystopian kind of a feel. And just seeing some of the businesses open, seeing people sitting in them, gave me a sense of comfort, but no mask, no mask, very little distancing in these restaurants. I don't know if this is a small business thing or what, or the memo hasn't come down, but the places that were open that had people in them, they were not distanced. And I, and I don't think from a business standpoint, you can even afford to socially distance because your business is now cut in less than half because your 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 square footage, your front footprint was never that big to begin with. Yeah, I mean, I have a buddy of mine's 36 table restaurant went down to like 12 tables. Yeah, so, you can't do it. So look, here's the thing. I I'm telling you this right now, okay? I'm not I'm not Dr. Fauci. I'm not President Trump. I'm not Gavin Newsom. I'm saying all these things like you thought I was those people. I'm not any of those people. I'm just here to tell you what I saw with my own eyes this weekend. But you said you you got scared about it. Oh, no, no. you didn't, didn't go. And my original theory was that, did you figure that out? Or no. did, did GF tell you, yeah, we ain't going? Girlfriend did not. Here's what happened. Let me tell you what happened. So girlfriend and I get together Friday evening and we go out for a walk. We like to walk, talk. We needed to breathe. I mean, both of us, you know, we're feeling some things, right? And so we go out on this really nice walk. And let me tell you something. We actually shared a really wonderful moment. As a guy, we're going to talk to Doug Allen about this coming up in a little bit, especially a guy who's been divorced. A guy like me, a guy like Doug, who's going to talk about this later. Um, you know what we all want desperately is we want our partner, our wife, girlfriend, whatever. We want our partner and whatever else you're into. Dude, we want our partner to support us, to tell us, hey, I believe in you. I support you. You know what I mean? And so, so girlfriend and I were out for a nice walk and she tells me this and I just feel like a million bucks, you know? And we wind up walking to one of her neighbor's houses where they've got three couples. So now there's eight of us and we're having like a little backyard happy hour. Very nice. Everybody's socially distancing too because a couple of people in education, they're very serious about this, you know? And then the eight of us left their house, walked to a restaurant around the corner. There were, if, if there were normally in a, Full house. If there were 50 people, there were 10 people max. We were able to go out back on a deck, eight person table, have the whole room to ourselves. So I did go out. I was in a restaurant. I wasn't wearing a mask. No one in there said I had to wear a mask as far as I recall. 
the people who were working there were all wearing masks, but the patrons were not wearing masks. So I'm telling you this, I'm reporting to you now and telling you this. I'm not saying that from a scientific standpoint, this thing's over. I'm saying from an American standpoint, based on what I saw this weekend, this thing seems to be over. And that has been decided organically by the people, not by the government or the science community necessarily. Hey, you're free. Restaurants are open. Offices are open. The beach is open. <laughs> See you later, dog. I'm going to live. And that's what I saw this weekend. I saw the same right. thing too. Yeah. Um, I didn't go anywhere except the park with like six friends and we didn't even get close to each other. Um, I went to two restaurants and got takeout. I, I, I don't, I don't understand, I guess the hurry to get back to everything, but that's just me. I, if you do it, you do it. That's on you. But yeah, I see the same thing. I went to me and the fiance went to Coronado last night for a walk at sunset and we bounced cause it was so crowded and there was nobody wearing a, a fucking mask. Like, and it's not like it, it to me, I'm not the kind of person that's going to be like, look at, look at that fucker. He's not wearing a mask. I should tell him, like, I don't, if you don't wear one, you don't wear one. I don't care. But doesn't mean I got to stick around for it. So we bounced and yeah, all around Coronado, it was, it was lots of people not wearing masks. And it, it's, it's, it's the, that old thing, you know, you give an inch, they take a mile and that's just what it's going to be, man. It's the American way of doing things. So and I disagree with you, Scott. I don't. I do think that the government declared it over. When you open everything, even if it's at half capacity, it's open. It's over. And just because the virus isn't over doesn't mean that the quarant the quarantine is officially over. And as an executive decision, I'm taking the thing down. We're not at day seventy no more. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'm man, taking it down. I, I, the man I listen, think it's I over. I want to it's empower over. this man. Make executive decisions. You have the you are empowered to do so, Alex. And I and I applaud you for immediately making the executive decision. But I have one question for both of you, gentlemen. And then Browner, I know you want in on this. Offices aren't open yet, though. Offices are open. When will you come back here? When will you come back to, to working from a home base? But see, or or will we just continue to do this? Well, let me ask Brown. Well, not ask a question, just an observation. The studio is not in an office. So there are children running around and doing things are your children acting like the people running around are they being responsible because that's a big influence too you know like can your children go contract something never show a sign and throw it all around that studio yeah they could no different than you were on coronado and you bounced but you still were there and some guy sneezed 100 miles away and that sneeze came in and, and somehow it oh it's not okay no. Oh. But that's also that's also the confined space thing is a lot different than being outdoors. Oh, all right, Browner, what do you think about all this? Did you, I observed America has reopened. I agree with you, and there's no turning back. The oh. people have spoken. The arrogance of America is officially on display for the rest of the world to see. Now, however, this turns out. I hope it's not bad, but we in it now. It, the, the, the movie has started and you in your seat, whether you want to sit down or not. So I don't I don't know what happens next. They say there's a second wave of it. The second wave is already hitting certain states. It's already hitting different different countries. California, we kind of dodged a bullet considering our capacity. Arizona never really got hit bad. And they're already out there partying. Missouri out there partying. Places are outliving as if this almost never happened. So I think July 4th, is going to make Memorial Day look like nothing. <laughs> so I hope that people are taking into consideration that, yes, you may not be able to socially distance at certain places, but please wear a mask if you go indoors. I know it may look goofy and you may not feel cool or you fill in the blank. But if you go indoors in a restaurant or in a business, do yourself a favor and wear a mask, man, because I'm telling you right now, the person next to you that you don't know may not give a shit about you, but you got to make sure that you care about yourself and those around you. All right. Public service announcement from the big Brown himself. All right, also, listen. also, we're going to have to go back. Like, yes, if, if we're if we're going back on radio July 6th or 4th, we are not ready to go back technically, like oh, no. by an engineering point. standpoint. So I honestly, I was fully expecting you to tell us uh, uh, June 1st, we're back in studio. That would be wonderful, by the way, because in all seriousness, and we're going to talk to Doug Allen about this coming up shortly. 
Um, he talked about entourage as being a group of dudes, you know, like they, everybody's got their boys, you know, part of the camaraderie of being on a team is, you know, high-fiving and fist bumping and working together and being close and looking each other in the face. I mean, you guys look great on, on camera right now. Okay. But it, it will, it will be fun again. Uh, I, I have people asking me, Hey, when can I come be a guest on the podcast? And I'm like, when we all get back together, here's the phone we, number. Yeah, we can do remote. <laughs> you know? can do remote. Here's we the phone all, number. We can do all this remote stuff, but um, uh, I'm dude. By the way, I was fully expecting it. And the moment you guys say let's do it, you know, we obviously can do it. I trust you guys to be safe. I I know I'm trusting myself to be safe. So I already gave it to y'all. Might as well give it to you guys again. <laughs> yeah, really. no, don't do that again. You had it twice. Coming well, out of the two corner, two Scott, time, he, two time survivor. Scott never had it. Yeah, I don't think I had it. Oh, well, and I also tested negative for the antibodies. Right. Hey, give yeah. me one of those tests. I'll get you one. I have them. You have, have antibody tests at your house? I don't, but a close friend of mine does. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. All right. Let me say this. Um, as we come on here on a Monday, I want to say thank you to all of our great sponsors, as I normally would do. Corky's Pest Control, 1-800-901-1102. I spoke to Cork this weekend. You know, Cork's, Cork's in his 70s, and he's like, dude, I'm still quarantined. He goes, young guy like you? I'm like, that's right, Cork 50. Young guy like you? Get out there and live. You know, go on the beach with no mask, but Cork is still holed up in his place and still quarantining. And I want to say to everybody that the the refer a great friend offer continues. I'm a Corky's Pest Control customer. Doug Allen is in Beverly Hills and he is not currently. I say to Doug, you need to get with Corky's to take care of that rat problem you have. Doug, don't know if you have that. Uh, ants. And then Doug becomes a Corky's customer and I get the referral fee, 35 bucks. Refer a great friend when you are a Corky's customer. Corky will pay you $35. Call 1-800-901-1102. Yes, in Los Angeles. Yes, in San Diego. Yes, in Riverside. 1-800-901-1102 for Corky's Pest Control. Hey, Mountain Trust Mortgage and Realty Services. I don't know, Alex, does this make it in to the uh, conversation with Doug? Because when we start with Doug, things are a little choppy. And he actually told us that the house that he lives in, that he bought, he bought it from the actor James Kahn. I'm going to keep it in, yeah. Okay. So we'll caution everybody. The beginning is choppy, but then he actually leaves and goes to a place where it's perfect. So um, it's kind of fun to actually see it all play out like that, the backstage stuff. We could clean it all up for you, but why? Um, anyway, he's living in James Kahn's house. He, he says, I bought it from James Kahn. Dude, don't ever make a move in real estate without calling Gary Cooper. That was really going to be the moral of the story. Eight eight five eight three seven six twelve ninety nine. I thought you were going to say, don't make a move without calling James Conn. Yeah, don't. If you want to buy <laughs> James Conn's house, okay, you call Gary Cooper. Eight five eight three seven six twelve ninety nine. Gary Cooper takes care of all of it. Takes care of the whole deal. You don't. You don't buy, sell, or refinance without our guy Gary Cooper. Eight five eight three seven six twelve ninety nine. And listen, Tory Holistics. Uh, what can I tell you about Tory Holistics, man? They make it so easy for you to save 20% when you use the promo code GRANDE. Now, if you got our email this weekend, 15,000 strong, um, I did not change the promo code. My bad. On uh -oh. me. Yeah, on me. The promo code is GRANDE. The unfortunate part is I had to tell our sponsor, hey, um, not that many people actually read the emails. You know what I mean? That's kind of the unfortunate part. We hit them with emails and people like you get them. I mean, you just freaking delete emails, dude. But the promo code is grande. You know what people do open up? They open up text messages and our partners are smsglobal.com. They should be your partners too because now more than ever, you need to reach your people. You need to reach your clients, your customers. Hey, our restaurant's open. Our hands are clean. We're wearing masks. Text these people. smsglobal.com is our text. text. There. there you go. Text. Uh, dude, I was, uh, do you want to save it for highlight of the day? the new website and show people how to get to Tori Holistics? No, I think it's a good idea to do it right now if you can share your screen. Can you do that? Yeah. Okay. So we have a new website and- um, Beautiful I, I, new website. Yeah, it's great. I've, I've talked about the possibility of having to change the name of the show as we possibly go back onto radio. In other words, as we go from radio to podcasting, podcast actually then gets put onto the transmitter. Um, I've talked about possibly needing to change the name of the show, but- we bought this URL, scottandbr.com, and we started building this website, scottandbr.com, and we haven't been, we haven't decided on, on a name change quite yet, and even if we're going to name change. And, um, and so Alex's cousin, Nancy, and her husband, both of them ripped, by the way. I mean, freaking just buffed, both of them. 
they built this beautiful new website for us. Grande, um, yeah. I love this. I love what's going on on our new website. Yeah, so basically it's easy now. You, this is the homepage. It's a video of us laughing. And you just scroll down. All these links work. Uh, you could either click this Toy Holistics one right here or click the big one and it takes you to the promo page. So it's going to look a little different. But since we're here, I might as well show you guys. If you scroll down, the latest episode right there. So you'll see today's episode right there. And then all the other ones, you can check us out on Instagram and Twitter. It's all right there. Uh, you, all This is every place that we're at. You know, Click on that. Little pictures. Uh, Mountain Trust, Gary Cooper. Hit them Look up. Look at that hat. Uh, Scott's bio, blah, blah, Corky's, blah. everything is all, everything in one place. All you got to do is scroll down. That's all you my favorite do. picture. That's my favorite picture at the bottom of the homepage yeah. is the picture of us at the Cleveland or in Miami beach. It's coronavirus was happening and I was drinking a Corona and we posted this picture on Instagram. And I remember people commenting like, Oh dude, you're going to get the virus. And I swear to you, no bullshit. I mean, this is early February. I didn't even know what the coronavirus was in early February. I was in Miami. I was at the Super Bowl. We were there. We were having a good time. We were on podcast row. We were first year of podcast row. And I had no idea what was going on. Mm -hmm. Just none. And uh, I had it. So, and you had it from Miami. Okay. Um, So listen, let me say uh, a couple of shout outs. Total T clinic. When can I get back and get a shot of testosterone in my ass, please? When when can I get back and get another shot? Yeah. How about that? How about we go back to the studio when you get a shot in your ass? Yeah. And I want to send shout outs to rock and wine tours. My man, Toby, Toby's like, dude, yeah, America's reopening, but I got news for you. Um, the wineries haven't opened in Temecula yet. So sending out some love and some shout outs to rock and wine tours. June 1st, Toby. June 1st is when they're, they're, they're going to open. I got, I got a lot. Of, you guys know, I got a lot of boys that work at breweries mm-hmm. and a lot of those breweries, the big ones are looking at June 1st as the date that they'll be back right wow. now. You're tied to having food. Mm-hmm. So if you're, the winery doesn't have some sort of food, whether it's a food truck or something like that, you will not probably be able to open. Mm-hmm. But if you get a food truck on your establishment, you should be able to go like today. I want to know which one of your boys in the beer business is going to say, hey, let's already bring the talk podcast. to him, bro. Yeah, let's bring the podcast to our re-grand opening so that people can see all the product placement in the background. And here we are sipping on their beers. And uh, when is that happening? So the same people that we've had conversations with, uh, Eyebrows perked up when I told him 1090. So, all right, I've, I've been I've been in their ears, dude. Yeah, it's amazing how radio it's it's incredible. Freaking Joe still Rogan works. Signs still a hundred million dollar deal with Spotify. I see a New York Times piece today where they're talking about how Rogan now has become mainstream media. That's that's what the deal is. It's no longer you know it, like like the UFC used to be like oh, that's ugly and behind the scenes and that's not mainstream sports. I don't want to see that necessarily. That was UFC. And and in, in most recently, that was podcasting. Yeah, yeah, I know it's there and I know lots of people do it, but it's it's not the big time. And then Joe Rogan signs a $100 million deal and the New York Times says, this is now what mainstream media looks like. So here's a, but listen, you can't fight the truth. And the article that you read, I heard about, I read about, I heard about it, so I wouldn't look at it as well. If the main source of news for people is Joe Rogan's podcast. They're going to be vastly ill-informed. Well, why news? What is what? Why is it news? Because a lot of people, because he has a lot of uh, political speakers on there. Mm-hmm. He has a lot of people on there with uh, far right, far left opinions. So it's a place for opinions. It's not a place for news. It's not a fact-based uh, uh, um, foundation in which the podcast cr- was created. It was created for entertainment. And so if people are treating that, like even when The Daily Show was huge with Jon Stewart, that had a monocle, monicum of uh, information-based comedy in it. This does not. This is just a guy having people on discussing their version of what something is. But so being it, mainstream doesn't make you a news source. No, no, that's no. what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. It, is, what what that, I got from the article, yeah. the same article, you what I got yeah. from is that people a younger generation of people are absorbing joe rogan's information and from his guests as news he's not saying he's a news organization that's not what i'm saying people are absorbing his information well that's people as in news. general because just because a television station calls themselves blank news doesn't really mean that that news is accurate yeah i mean that's that like to me i guess what i took from it was joe rogan is now mainstream media because more 
dollars have been invested into something that was always considered like easy for anybody to do. And when you've gone from, you know, the first day of podcasting to now several thousand later and a hundred million dollar contract, what that says to, to me, at least as the reader of that New York times piece was, Hey, you know, Howard Stern was mainstream media when he was on radio. Then he was no longer mainstream media when he went to Sirius satellite radio. Then he became mainstream media again because the popularity of, of, of Sirius satellite radio became greater and subscriptions grew and people wanted that content. It became mainstream. It's now in everybody's car, at least the opportunity to buy it. And Rogan has gone from, oh, cute little show on YouTube. Wait, why the hell does he have 10 million downloads to now somebody's willing to pay a hundred million dollars to bring that engagement to their platform. And that is what makes that now, according to the way I read the piece, that's now mainstream media, you know? So really interesting. And uh, like I said, we'll talk to, to Doug Allen, the creator of Entourage about this coming up in a few minutes. But hey, look, for me, the weekend, I will tell you guys that on Sunday afternoon, on a beautiful day, I made time to be inside in front of the television to watch the match. And I was being told this is never going to happen because the weather sucks. It's raining. It's never going to happen. They're not even going to play it. I made time to watch the match. I didn't sit in front of the TV and watch the entire thing, but I was in and out all day keeping track of what was going on on the match. I will tell you this. I liked it. I don't know that if every Sunday I had to watch two great pros and two non-pro golfers all play golf, I don't know if I'd watch it every week. By the way, I don't watch the PGA Tour every week, so I don't watch golf that much. I watch the Masters and the U.S. Open and you know the Farmers Insurance Open when it's here in San Diego. So I liked it, though. I was entertained by it. I mean, thank goodness you've got Phil Mickelson. Phil Mickelson is a character. He's the guy that stirs it all up. Phil Mickelson's great. Um, Peyton Manning's funny, and we, we all have seen Peyton Manning for years on SNL and in TV commercials. Peyton Manning's funny. Tiger Woods doesn't crack a smile till he finally wins because for Tiger Woods, <laughs> it's life and freaking death to him. And Tom Brady is playing such bad golf that it's it's almost embarrassing. Like, oh my God, it's the weather, it's the game, it's the equipment that's hanging from the back of my pants. It's all of the pressure of the world watching me play golf, even though I've already won six Super Bowls. And I am just terrible, or as Barkley would say, terrible, terrible. just terrible. And then- then just when Brady is so bad and as Barkley is teasing him, what does Brady do? Comes up with this insanely clutch shot, right? And then makes it even better. Reaches down to grab the ball out of the, of the cup and rips his pants like a normal human <laughs> thing. The, there was a part of me that watched this and loved this so much because I thought to myself, oh my God, there's something on the planet that I'm better than Tom Brady at, and that's golf. And guess what? I suck at golf. Anybody who's watching or listening right now who heard the setup, oh my God, there's something that I'm better than Tom Brady at. Yeah, I said golf. And you're like, but you suck at golf. I know I suck at golf. He sucks at golf. So <laughs> it was awesome to see, you know, I love when Phil Mickelson, you know, cups out or lips out of, from a two foot putt. It makes him normal. I thought it was fun. I thought it was a great piece of, of, of entertaining sports television in a world where we're jonesing for it. And they gave you lots too. You want to gamble on it? You can gamble on it. There was a lot to it. I thought it was great. Uh, I would love to see it again. Maybe next time you, you bring in two different non-pro golfers and you just keep making it interesting like that. Bring in Michael Jordan. Bring in Steph Curry. Two basketball players that both think they're really great golfers. I loved watching the interaction between Phil and Tom. I thought it was all really interesting. So um, I don't know. Did you guys? Did you guys make time for it? No. I saw. I saw. <laughs> I caught. You're the guy who said you'll watch anything he sports is. related. He yeah. Is. I also tweeted at you, you guys, yesterday or Sunday, whenever it was, saying, "Hey, I lied because it turns out I like what I like. Don't really like golf. Don't like watching golf on TV. Sorry, not sorry." Uh, I will tell you this, man. I thought it was I thought it was great, but I thought it was the worst thing that could have happened to golf because it showed you how entertaining golf could be from a standpoint of this person's mic'd up, this person's got being interviewed. It gave you golf in a different way and 
it got 6 million people to watch. Now, obviously, Alex didn't jump in, and I didn't jump in until the very end. But if 6 million people watched this and it was the highest golfing thing ever viewed, that's not good for golf and <laughs> everyday golfers. That uh, two old football players and two golfers at the end of their rope, basically, could draw 6 million people. And Rory McIlroy and Dustin Johnson and all these other young and up-and-coming guys can't do that on a weekend during the PGA Tour. I, that's I think been the that's, PGA's biggest problem for 20 years now. They're a tiger tour. They're not a – that's all they got, man. For some, for whatever reason, people will don't tune in to watch Dustin Johnson. People do not tune in to watch Rory McIlroy. People do not tune in. I don't even know who's the best – who's the best – who's the number one golfer right now? I don't even know. Well, hold on. You're, you're, I'm going to disagree with you, and I'm going to tell you where you're wrong. You know who tunes in for that stuff? Golf fans. Golf fans tune in because golf fans love golf. Golf fans love the young stars the way football fans like to tout the young stars or basketball fans. But – See, what you guys said was, you're fringe fans. You're not really golf fans. I'm admitting it too. Masters, U.S. Open, maybe a big championship of some kind. If I find out that Tiger's in it on Sunday, maybe I'm watching. Farmers Insurance Open, Riviera, whatever, West Coast Swing. But you said that you're so hungry for sports, and America is so hungry for sports, <laughs> that we'll take anything we can get. And the numbers would prove that people really were – still home and we're looking for something on TV and that star power always wins. You mentioned those other young guys who are, who are golf stars. They're golf stars. They're not superstars. These four guys, they're superstars. That's the difference. But, yeah. that, but, but that's the driving point. It gave you golf in a way that the PGA won't give it to you. I don't know anything about Dustin Johnson. Yeah, you got Johnson. whispering. Yeah, I don't know anything about Dustin Johnson because I'm not going to go look him up. He might be in a commercial. I won't know who the hell he is until they put his name underneath them. Golf needs to find a way to get Alec, guys like Alex and myself to start watching it if they want to grow the game with these younger guys. You just can't keep thinking, well, we're going to run Tiger out there and people going to watch. Because if he doesn't show up, I'm not showing up. You know why? I'm not entertained by these other dudes. Put somebody out there or entertain me. And they're not entertaining me unless Tiger's out there. You hear that golf? My man John Browner said, "Entertain him." Entertain me. <clears throat> you heard let it. me. Let me see two guys talk trash to each other. Let me. See also, like, why can't golfers, PGA golfers, uh, drive a cart? What's like, the big I, deal? I'll, I'll tune. I'll tune in to watch like Tiger and Phil like race a cart around like in the between holes. <laughs> how'd you like? That sounds more fun. How'd you like the hole where they had to play with just one club? I love that. I love that. They only play with one club. Even putt. With that same club. Okay, so I didn't watch I any didn't of it, that but I did. I did catch up on Twitter, and the only thing that people cared about on Twitter was Charles Barkley talking shit to Tom Brady. That's right. And then Justin Thomas calling Charles Barkley a fat ass on television, <laughs> and that's really like exactly what golf has been missing, right? In 2020 or in 2019, whatever year, or ever. It, that's literally what they've been missing: the ability to go viral because of things that that way. And and I'm guarantee you, there's. A bunch of dudes that are above 40 years old that are like, that's I don't want to see that in my golf tournament. Yeah, well, that's the problem. Like nobody wants to watch a golf tournament because it's boring as hell watching like guys whisper. All right, let me let me roll on here. On a Monday afternoon, that was my first thought. My first thought was America's wide open, and I watched the match. And I know six million others watched the match, desperate for sports coverage this past weekend. Okay. Thank you to Corky's Pest Control, 1 800 901 1102 Thank you to Mountain Trust Mortgage and Realty Services, 858-376-1299. Thank you to Tory Holistics, where you'll save 20% using our promo code GRANDE. And you'll hear more about that with the highlight of the day coming up shortly. But right now, for the first time ever in our show's history, here is Doug Allen. And let me explain to you really quickly about this. I've talked about my BFF, my lifelong brother who lives in Los Angeles. I've shown you guys when we've talked about this on the show, but not that in great detail. Anyway, my best friend from my childhood lives in Beverly Hills. He becomes friends with this guy, Doug Allen. They become like brothers and best friends at this stage of life, you know, that 40 to 50 time. And that's how I've gotten to know Doug ever so slightly over the last few years. Lots of parties, lots of social time, but very little you know, chance to do what we're doing today, which is to really dig in. So I've seen Doug make a bunch of appearances recently, only to find out that now he's got something he would like to promote, which is his new podcast. And so I said, now would be the time to come on. 
So for the first time, and definitely not going to be the last time, and stick with us because the first part of this, Doug is downstairs in his house and the Zoom is not really going well, but he's a cool guy and he said, hey, I'll move up to my office where things will be hard line. So stay with us through all of this because this is really, really cool. Uh, Doug Allen, the creator of Entourage, for the first time, here he is. Yeah. Uh, Alex, we rolling? We're rolling. All right. So Doug, um, let me just start off by asking you this. This is just guy question here. But first of all, what were you drinking? What is that? It's a smoothie. It's like uh, a heaven can wait. If you remember the movie, whey protein shake. Do you remember yeah. that spinach and whey? So anyway, I'm trying to be healthy while this is all going on. Um, did you just mention the movie heaven can wait? One of my favorites. Yes. Oh my God. Warren Beatty is the star quarterback of the Rams and Dick Emberg is the announcer. Yep. I can't tell you how much time I spent with Dick Emberg in the final eight to 10 years of his incredible life. Wow. And we would, we would go down to his, his like man cave in his house in La Jolla. And one of my favorite artifacts from his life was the scene of Dick in the NBC sports jacket calling the game, you know, that Warren Beatty and the Rams are playing. Heaven can wait. Dude, you nailed one of my favorites right out of the gate. It's the best. Dick was one of my favorites, and that movie is, I mean, it's a perfect, perfect movie. And I became a Rams fan because of that, and I'm not a Rams fan anymore, but when I was a child, that and uh, something, Joey, if you remember that movie. Wait, John what was the name of that movie? Story. Wait, oh, something for Joey. Something for Joey. Were you a yeah. Penn State fan? I was not. I just was like a sensitive, emotional kid. And when I saw him have cancer and John Capaletti, like, give the Heisman Trophy to his sick brother, I just became a rampant. So. Oh, my God, dude. These are movies straight out of my childhood as well. So uh, I'm, I'm glad we're, we're starting to talk about this. Um, what else? Like, Because now I'm, I'm going in a completely different direction. I'll start talking about <laughs> movies right from the beginning. <laughs> uh, what else? Uh, yeah. Heaven can great. wait. Something for Joey. Movies. Well, I live. Well, Go ahead. I brought. I don't know. Are you guys freezing? I'm freezing a little bit. Yeah, we are. You freezing guys are a freezing bit. a little bit. I don't know if it's. I don't know if it's me or you. Um, well, I live in. Uh, James Khan lived in this house before I did, um, and I have a Brian song poster hanging up about two rooms over. So that's also you know one of the great sports movies made. Oh, I didn't realize that. You bought James Kahn's house or a house that he had once owned. Is that right? Yep. So, okay. So we, so we started off talking about movies and just as we switched from where you were in your house to now up into your office, both of these guys just said this to me, dude, I don't know what the hell you two guys are talking about. I don't know what movies you guys are talking about. <laughs> are you guys kidding me right now? I mean, these are, uh, I mean, Gail Sarah's, you know who that is, but the, the, uh, Brian Piccolo was, uh, he got sick and, uh, he was a running back or a fullback for the bears with Gail Sears and they were best friends. And it's James Conn movie that, I mean, is, is a, is a guy movie that guys cry at. I mean, that's what I was telling uh, Scott is like, the only reason I know that movie is because you put it in the show and you had the guys cry. I, I did. Yeah. And, and it's I, one of my, yeah. I, I had I saw Brian Stone because I'm from Chicago, but the other two movies, uh, Heaven Can Wait, uh, uh, cool, uh, sounds great. I don't know, I don't know. Heaven Can Wait, as Chris Rock will say, is one of the greatest movies ever. He did a, I love Chris. He did a bad remake of it. I forgot the name of it, where he was a comedian. But Heaven Can Wait is legitimately one of the best movies ever made, and definitely one of the best sports movies ever made. Um, but Warren Beatty is the quarterback for the Rams. And he dies in an accident. And it's one of the first, you know, body switch movies. But it's excellent. It was nominated for an Academy Award. Buck Henry should watch it, like, today. Can I ask you a question? <laughs> you said you were a Rams fan. This is totally off topic. Why are you no longer a Rams fan? Because we know a little thing about leaving a team like the Chargers left us, so we know our longer Charger fans. So 1984, I'm a, I'm a crazy Rams fan who lives in New York who wears the Eric Dickerson jerseys, and my friends all make fun of me. But uh, – <laughs> I swear to God, I, my brother went to Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, and we're at the hotel dropping him off. I'm 10, 11, whatever. I'm playing Asteroids, and the Giants are playing the Steelers in a, in a preseason game. I swear to God this is true. And uh, I'm playing Asteroids as a kid, and a guy, big man, walks in and says, 
can I play with you? Okay, so we play asteroids together, and then uh, I realize he's a football player, and I get his autograph, and it's a a before his rookie season Lawrence Taylor. So oh wow, I switched to the Giants immediately. Became like LT, became my idol in football uh, for obvious reasons, um, and then uh, that was it. So I've been a Giants fan ever since. Okay, but what is Lawrence Taylor? doing in Pittsburgh at they that playing, time? They were playing the Steelers. He's a rookie playing the oh, Steelers in a preseason game. Gotcha. And that, as I recall, the Marriott in Pittsburgh and the whole Giants team was staying there. So um, that's how I switched. Is this Asteroids game a stand-up Asteroids game or is it a sit-across two-person, like a Miss Pac-Man kind of thing? I mean, you're, you're around my age, so you know real asteroids. This is real, authentic asteroids, 25 cents, standing up in the days when, you know, we used to drive an hour to get to a place to play this game. That's how obsessed we were with it. So. Yeah, I understand. that. There were some other good ones at the time, like Defender was an excellent game. Did you ever play Defender? Of course. Saxon and Pac-Man and, you know, Space Invaders. So, yeah, I, I was obsessed with video games. Donkey Kong was another yeah. great one, you yeah. know? And I'll tell you one of my all-time favorites, because this was at the roller skating rink that I grew up in, was the USSR versus, versus the USA in bubble hockey. And that was one of my faves. I kind of remember that. I don't, I don't remember that well. I was a big hockey guy. I don't, I don't know if I know that one. But it's Zaxxon a, was an underrated great game. Zaxxon, I don't know. I, I got to be honest. I don't know Zaxxon. You just got me. I'm a, I'm a Contra man. I like Contra. I don't know that. Contra is like, a, so they drop these two, these army guys into like a jungle background and you just start blowing things up. It's fantastic. Really? Right, Stand up video I, game. I think I'm the youngest one here. I think NBA Jam is where I started. <laughs> and Street Fighter. <laughs> well, <laughs> like RBI Baseball, which was when I was in college. Did you ever play that? I mean, that was unreal. Vince Coleman was so fast. He wanted to get him. <laughs> great. Oh, my, oh my God. I swear to God, dude, you're, you're, you're knocking this out of the park today. I'm not, I'm not lying to you when I tell you that I played golf for the first time in a year about a month and a half ago at a charity event here in San Diego. And who did I play with? Vince Coleman. Spent the whole afternoon with Vince Coleman. What a guy. Yeah, I mean, that, he had some speed. I mean, so, yeah. That's cool. So, dude, explain. Let me, I'll just jump right into it because I'm curious about this. Alex has already referenced that something from your real life you know, turned out to be content on Entourage. Yeah. Um, can you just go back to the beginning of how Entourage became what it was, about what it was in your background, in your real life, that essentially turned into this show? I mean, pretty much everything in that show sort of came from my life. And how it started was, which also came from my life, uh, I, had a, a, I had a very strict mother growing up, and I had a little fight with a an airline lady in the old days when you would call and try to change your flights and I had a fight and my mother was the travel agent and whatever I did, I was so aggressive that they legitimately called the travel agency to, to log a complaint against me. <laughs> so that story turned into a, which is crazy that Curb is still going strong, but that turned into a Curb Your Enthusiasm spec script, which means I just sat in my house by myself and wrote a, an episode of Curb. I sent that to my manager, who was also Mark's manager, Wahlberg, and uh, he read it and said, and I knew Mark for years, said, you know, we're thinking about this idea about Mark and his friends called Entourage. And, and after reading this script, you know, you should write it. So that's where it started. And, uh, you know, uh, when I got into it, I said to Mark, I said, I, I want to I make, I want to use experiences of yours as I see them, but I'm going to make them New York guys and I'm going to end up using a lot of my own stuff. And Mark was amazing and said, just, you know, make it good. So um, a lot of the experiences in the show came from that. My son was on the show playing Ari's son. Ari's wife was named Melissa based on my wife. And there's a million examples of it. But That's really cool. Um, how about all the sports figures that found their way into the show were those all just guys you're like hey i'm a fan of his i'd like to meet him let's get him on the show to be honest with you you know it was so hard to get guests in season one when no one knew the show and then by season three they were calling us so i'm such a you know kind of sports nerd you know who wishes i was an athlete 
So any of them who called me, I usually found a way to get in there. Now, there were different examples of that. Like LeBron actually called and said, I want to be on the show. And of course, you're on the show, you know. <laughs> Tom Brady, Mark said, when, when Eli Manning screwed me over pretty bad, Mark Wahlberg said, what if I get Tom Brady to do it? And then he did it with him, which was incredible, obviously. You know, all the yeah. guys that you have still hold up today. You got LeBron, you got Tom Brady, you got Phil Mickelson. This weekend, Tom and Phil together. Is Tom as bad of, of a golfer uh, as, he did, as he was this weekend? Well, two things. Phil was on the show, too. Yeah. Interesting. yeah. But Tom, you know, is unreal. And, again, we're talking about golf as a sport. It's hard to measure how good they are because you just like, you know, it's not basketball with all these skills, so you don't realize it. But – Tom walked onto the set of Entourage on a, on a golf course at 7 o'clock in the morning in the, in the freezing rain, picked the club up, and took one 250 and almost holding one. It. So as far as I'm concerned, he's an unbelievable golfer. <laughs> and uh, just imagine if Phil or Tiger had to go play quarterback for a day, you know, even if there were no cameras rolling. But he's, he's pretty unbelievable. Well, that's what I thought was super interesting this weekend. I, I'm going to take it that you sat and watched the match this weekend, I, right? I watched a good portion of it, yeah. Okay, me too. So what I thought was super interesting was, like, I get to stand on sidelines of NFL games and interview these dudes as soon as the game is over. I'm down here with Peyton Manning. And when I, I – dude, I'm six feet. Peyton Manning is, like, legit 6'6". Six, six, but yeah. he's not just tall. He's just big. His Present. face is long. His yeah. freaking torso is kind of short, but his arms are super long. Yeah. Right. And, and so you see how big Peyton Manning really is in real life. And then you see Tom Brady, who's pretty much kind of like that too. Yeah. Then you see them standing next to Phil and Tiger. And Phil and Tiger, they, they could never go do what Peyton and Tom do. Because you just, it's a big man's game. Yet, yeah. that's what's so interesting. If you took Russell Wilson and you took Drew Brees and you put them next to Phil Mickelson and Tiger Woods, you'd be like, Which, who's, who's the world-class athlete here? which is what makes Russell Wilson and Drew Brees that much more interesting to me. But, yeah. man, just seeing those guys standing there together was fascinating. Well, well Russell, Russell's a, a good friend of mine. And Russell, the day, like the week of the draft, was in L.A. And I took him out with actually with a couple of the Entourage guys. Nobody knew who he was. And Russell, you know, he, looks, he doesn't look like a big guy. I mean, you, you wouldn't think it. So everybody was like, who is this guy? I said, the Seahawks just drafted him, and everybody was like, at, at what? And I said, quarterback. And everyone was like, oh, oh, good luck, you know? And obviously, Matt Flynn had that big deal at the time. Um, but a guy like Russell, the athletic ability is so unbelievable, but the mind is mind-boggling. And that's really, to me, what separates the great ones, whether they have the athletic ability or not. Because, But I do, like, I love the – I love the little guys. That's why Steph is my favorite basketball player because to be able to do that at, at that size to me is, is what separates it. And obviously LeBron is amazing, but I think if I had LeBron's body, I, I would do well, you know? <laughs> do you, have you ever thought about doing a show, an entourage style show from a sports perspective, like a guy, like you follow a guy like Steph Curry, somebody who is an all-star and, and that is well-known that can't go out so you can cover it in a sense that you can – See, people, walk people through the things that Steph Curry goes through or somebody like Michael Jordan went through? Well, I'm, gonna, I'm working on a football, which is soccer to, to you and I, but uh, I'm working on a show with Thierry Henry um, that's got some similar aspects to that. I mean, obviously over the years, and there's been other shows that friends of mine have done, ballers and this and that. I've been asked to do 500 different versions of Entourage, which I probably should have done and cashed in on all of them, but I just didn't want to <laughs> kind of do the same thing. But it's been a while now, and I, I see a, a whole new world. The world of international football soccer is really interesting and different, and the fans there and the world there are so much more extreme than anything that's going on in sports here that we saw a different way in. So I'm working on that right now, actually. Now, hopefully there'll be uh, sports ever again. And, <laughs> and it makes sense because it almost sounds like sci-fi at this point. But. I saw uh, Jeremy Piven did a video for Barstool's Twitter about yeah. a possible spinoff. Is that a is that a, is that something that's possibly happening? No, <laughs> no, right? <laughs> yeah. I saw this. I thought it was the most random video. It was this, uh, Jeremy did a, just a, a video on Twitter for Barstool saying like, you know, "Yeah, maybe." Kind of like you know, it's kind of like everything like everything that Entourage was about, which was friendship and loyalty, is is kind of like the antithesis of the idea of that. So 
Um, that show, to me, I had five guys. I wouldn't change one of them for anybody on the whole planet. But uh, I wouldn't do any Entourage material without all of them. It just wouldn't happen. So. Hey, Doug, what was life like before Entourage for you? I mean, you, as I know the story that you'd, you'd come out from New York, as I recall, you were, you were trying to become a stand-up comedian as I, yeah. at the beginning, and then yeah. found your way into, like, again, the story, as I recall, is like mailroom, you know, like early yeah. entry-level kind of stuff. Yeah. So I'm just curious, uh, what was life before the big hit happens? Um, yeah. In terms of fame, notoriety, wealth, et cetera, what was life like before Entourage? You know, I, I got to say, people ask me that all the time. Life, nothing really changed me except, fortunately, I had a little more money in my pocket. I was never, I, I always, however it worked, um, my access to some interesting people always kind of came into my life, like Mark, long before the show. But I made two independent movies prior to that that both got picked up by studios. They still play around the world and on cable and stuff. And I made a nice living in the business bef before Entourage. Obviously, Entourage took it to a new level, but my life didn't change. I'm, I've been a homebody uh, pretty much my whole life. I was married, you know, uh, for 20 years. And um, I'm not anymore. But, um, but uh, you know, no nothing, I can't really say that it changed that much. Um, because I still kind of do the same things. I like to hang out with my kids, my dogs. I like to play sports and whatever. But obviously, it was an amazing experience. And financially, it gave me, you know, it took away a lot of the fears I had for years before that. So Yeah. And, and dude, so, let me tell you something, man. Uh, marriage, as I have found out as well, very tough thing. You know, like, like you're married, you've got kids, you've got a job, you're trying to do right. You know, at least that's the way I was and, and essentially be a mensch, you know what I'm saying? And yeah. like, and, and I mean, all of a sudden the person I married, the time, who they became, who I became, um, all of a sudden it just, shit just gets blown up, dude. And, yeah. you know, like, and even now I got four, I got four kids, three teenage daughters, dude. And it's like, like I'm, I know that I was not wired to be who I have to be today <laughs> just for these kids. You know what I'm saying? I mean, for me, it's, you know, it's different. I actually have a great ex-wife. I met, we met the day I got to Los Angeles and I'm just kind of, I mean, when I look at our marriage, I, I was the difficult one in the marriage and I'm very obsessive when I'm working, which is why I try to work as little as possible because I, <laughs> it, it does destroy me and, and not stuff like this. I started a podcast, by the way, what you guys do is, I, it, it's fun to me and you know, whether you're good at it or not is a different issue, but it's fun and easy to do as opposed to sitting in your house by yourself, trying to be funny, writing scripts. It's a very difficult process and to get that whole thing going. Um, but during that time, you know, I was difficult because I was obsessive and at four o'clock in the morning I was thinking story and I wasn't thinking about how I can balance both. So it, it's a, it's a tough balance, but, uh, you know, we, we had a good run and we have two amazing kids. So, you know, I know exactly what you're saying though, dude. I know exactly what you're saying. Cause if I look back on it now and if I'm really honest with myself, I've got to look in the mirror and say, you know, I was putting just so much energy into working, you know, and I was just trying to do everything I could to build a career. The radio show was growing. I was at every charity event in town. I was emceeing everything. And the yeah. truth of the matter is I was putting things in front of my wife and in front of my kids. You know, even, but even when it, I, it's a very tough balance and in, in the business that we're in, it's so competitive. And if you take a moment off, you know, it's, it's not easy to get back. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough balance. Yeah. But I hear what you're saying when you say, you know, if you take a moment off, cause that's, I, I would like to hear how, the, how you, cause you guys asked Alex about, and John about spinoffs, right? How did it, how did you guys decide to go from super established? I mean, iconic HBO series. And hey, let's take it to the big screen. Well, you know, that was, I honestly didn't want to do the movie, you know? I mean, for financial reasons, obviously I want to do it. And because I love these guys and love working with them. But I thought the show was over and I felt good about it. But uh, Mark, as the great producer he is, you know, said, listen, we can have a second life and we can resell this into syndication and there could be all sorts of things that could happen off of this. Now, unfortunately, the movie didn't perform like people would hope, even though I'm proud of it and whatever. But, uh, you know, I think it, it ran its course and it was a good run. But that was, you know, there seemed to be an appetite. Every time Mark was doing movie promotions, people were asking about Entourage. And we have a really great 
loyal fan base, but unfortunately wasn't big enough, quite big enough to make it a, a very successful movie. Again, it wasn't a failure, but it was just kind of, you know, what a, Dude, how what much, a, when you were in the middle of the show and you had like storylines like Aquaman, that's now a movie, you yeah. had Medellin who freak Narcos is like the biggest thing on Netflix. Yeah. Like yeah. was, the, were those storylines actually circulating in Hollywood that you just took or did uh, you just get lucky? I mean, well, lucky or not, I don't know, because Aquaman made a billion dollars and I have nothing to do with it. But <laughs> I seriously, when we came up with doing Aquaman, I thought it sounded like the stupidest movie to ever be made, and that's why I liked it. And the idea that James Cameron, was, in my mind at the time, was the only guy that could turn a really terrible idea into a movie that you go, wow. Now, 20 years later, or 15, whatever it is, CGI technology had changed so much that they were able to make an interesting, you know, successful movie. But at the time, to me, it was almost like a joke. Like, let's come up with the silliest character to make a movie about. And, you know, who knew that a decade later or 12 years later, superhero movies were going to be the only thing that, that got made. That make any <laughs> money now. You know, so there were a lot of things that I feel like I was very, you know, I saw the future somehow, but there was no design on it whatsoever. I mean, Medellin was a book, which is weird. Medellin is like, my name is in it. It's Med Ellen and, and my wife is, is Melissa Dana. So the whole ex-wife, so the whole thing was like weird, but I was reading that book, Killing Pablo in, on a vacation. And I said, Adrian could play Pablo Escobar. So there was no thought about any of that, but I know that there was a quote, Oliver Stone, um, I'm blanking on the movie now. He said something like Ari Gold convinced him to do some movie. So we had a lot of stuff. Great Gatsby and the Ferrari um, movie. Yeah, so the Ferrari movie. So we had a lot of stuff, but it's it's just cool, and I love to see that it some of it came to fruition. When you talk about these, the things in an entourage that that came to actual light, I want to talk about some of your first movies because you said you had a couple of independent movies that allowed you to do well uh, before Entourage. I saw Fat Beach in the '90s as a young fella. And I would not think a, a, a white guy directed that. So yeah, well, how did... mean, well, a couple of funny things about that. I mean, you know, when I, when I met with Ice Cube about doing Friday, when I got to the meeting, he didn't know I was going to be white. Now, that being, <laughs> said, that being said, Fat Beach is like, there's a lot of, of African-Americans that think the movie's offensive and awful. I was hired. Eh. Whatever it is, Chris Rock used to make fun of it and stand up. I was 22 years old just out of film school and a producer thought I was funny and said, come do this movie. So I do a movie called PHAT Beach, which I'm telling you in 1993, there wasn't a white person in America who knew what the word PHAT meant. And I'm serious. <laughs> so when he called me, I was like, what is this? Blah, blah, blah. And honestly, the movie had a weird little thing and it started going. And I remember, I remember when the cover of Sports Illustrated had Otis Anderson on the cover and it said fat back. And I was like, does that have anything to do with this movie that's like <laughs> kind of a piece of garbage? But we shot it in seven days. The fact that it was released around the world was <laughs> mind-boggling, you know? And uh, for me, it was a job. And a lot of people, I get a lot of stuff on Instagram. They're like, oh, how's Fat Beach 2 coming or whatever? There's Make it. There. Make it. I did the best I could. I, had, I actually had great actors. You know, in, in a little movie that cost $100,000, I was paid $10,000 to rewrite and direct that movie. And it was really like, when you're a film student and someone offers you, I probably would have done pornography at that point. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, you know, I did the best I could. And I'm proud that it still plays. And Complex Magazine did a 20-year retrospective of it. So, you know, it, it's pretty wild. And the other movie I did, which I actually love, was with one of my best friends, David Schwimmer. That was also a, a million two that movie cost, and it was released around the world like it was the giant Universal Studios movie. So, you know, it's an interesting ride, no matter how it goes. And we had yeah. Sammy Sosa in that, and I believe we might have been the first movie to shoot in Wrigley Field. I can't swear to that, but we shot in Wrigley Field with Sammy Sosa, which was very cool. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, I, uh, I could sit here and listen to these stories, by the way, all day long, but I did. you did say before we came on – that you have Gary Busey coming over to the house today. Is this right? He's going to come over to the office where we're going to do the podcast, which if you're listening to these stories, please tell all your listeners we're starting a podcast, Victory the Podcast with Kevin Dillon and Kevin Connolly and myself. And we're going to talk, you know, everything from entourage to careers to life to divorce to sports and everything. So 
Gary's going to be one of our first guests, and uh, that should be a wild ride. It really should. Uh, <laughs> uh, speaking of all those guys that were actors on Entourage, you know, you talked about what a great ride that was for you guys. Um, are those dudes now like typecast? Because to me, when if I were to see one of them in public, I'd say, "Hey, Turtle." You know, in fact, you guys did an episode. One of my favorites was here at Del Mar, right, right down the road from here at the racetrack. Yeah. And I remember, um, in, you guys had done were done shooting for the day, and the guys were up in the suites and they were hanging out. And I was standing next to Turtle, and I, I didn't, I didn't call him Jerry, like an idiot. You know what I mean? And and I'm standing next to him in the betting lines, and I thought this is awesome that you guys were here. But I guess my point is, do people typecast them to the point where it's like, oh no, you're Turtle, or no, you're this guy? Every every actor on a successful show is typecast until they do something that gets them out of that type. I mean, Woody Harrelson, I remember when all of a sudden he's doing Natural Born Killers, I was like, is this a joke, Woody from Cheers? And then you go, oh my God. So I had five actors that can do lots of things and they've all been working pretty consistently since. Jeremy had his own show, Jerry was on Power for five years, you know, uh, Kevin's done a ton of movies. And Kevin Dillon has had a 30 year career, yeah. you know, from millions of things. and. It's just the way the world perceives you. And it's to me, it's a compliment to the success of the show that you really felt these were the guys. But every one of them, you know, will have great careers and has before and after. So, you know, it's just, it's the way it is. The good news is I think, I think for the most part, they don't mind that. You know, they feel good about what we did. So with streaming Time services cat. and like HBO Max coming out and all that, um, are you still getting newer fans that are that are like coming to you, tweeting at you? It's like this show's awesome. I never heard of it. Well, I'm getting a lot of people like my friends' kids who now are finding it, and I hope HBO Max or wherever they're going to put it because I've seen what's happened to The Office. The Office, which is one of my favorite shows, we were on at the same time, and honestly, we were we were kind of neck and neck in in how the world was perceiving us, both kind of critically acclaimed and both. But that show. Uh, was launch on Netflix, launched it into another stratosphere. I hope that happens. You know, one of the things with Entourage, there is language in it that is not really PC today, which, you know, it is, It is again, it is what it is. But uh, I hope an audience finds it because I've been watching it now, you know, to get ready for this podcast because I haven't watched it in years. And to me, it holds up and it really is at the end of the day. It's not about a bunch of men chasing women. and It's about best friends and loyalty and any guy that I know that has a group of friends they grew up with kind of feels like this is me and my boys. And, you know, when LeBron was on this show, you know, he, he introduced me to everybody, Maverick and Rich. He said, this is my E, this is my turtle, and this is my drama. <laughs> so I, I've had that a lot, and that obviously makes me feel good. That's, uh, that's really cool, man. I, I think that's great. Hey, for those – and again, we'll do this again, please. But – um, where will people be able to see, hear your podcast? Is it audio? Is there video? What, what do you want I mean, people to know? We're going to shoot it also, but it's definitely audio. And I guess I, sh I should know the answers to this. But Kevin Connolly started a podcast company, which he's got, you know, a great, great, uh, great group of podcasts he's doing. And uh, I, obviously it'll be on Apple Podcasts. And I don't know how that works, Spotify and, and this and that. And we'll shoot it for YouTube and whatever. So, you know, we're going to get Gary. We're going to film Gary from, you know, getting into the car to drive to us to every moment and capture it with, with whoever we get. So, See, this sucks, man, that you're going to get into podcasting now because you're a director, you're a producer, you're a, you, you know, and you're going to go kick our ass because we're all now in our different places sitting in our studios because we still haven't come back yet post-COVID. And you guys are going to go do like bomb production. You know, it's, it's not going to be high end production, but it's funny because I was just talking to, we have a mutual best friend, Andrew left. I was talking to him this morning about, you know, the democratization of the world and, and people who have done what you do for 25 years. And then you have kids who can show up tomorrow with no training and nothing and, and take over the world. And, I think, obviously, I think it's good because I think talent should have the easiest road they, they should get if they work hard and do that. But there's a million podcasts, so there's no taking anything for granted. No, like, yeah. It is extremely difficult to get yeah. the word out about what you're doing. And um, and you got to do good stuff that people are interested in. So and I, but, but the good news for you is you've already got an excellent following, you know, like on Instagram, and, and you'll be able to hype this and promote this. And then you use friends, me, uh, Rich Eisen, and others, um, you know, bar stools, whatever. And, and you just constantly put the word out, dude. And, That's um, what you're to do. And I feel like the world right now, it is, it is a good world where all, everybody tries to help everybody rise, you know, and provided they're decent 
people. So, you know, that's what you'll do. And then again, at the end of the day, your content is either going to interest people or it isn't. It's just yeah. that simple. So it's not, it's not the game of like, like the, uh, the part my take guys are excellent. You know, you go do a thing with them and, and you go, okay, they're good. Even though they jump past, you know, millions of people that have been doing this, they're just good. So, um, it's gonna, it's, it's a wild world right now because you do have Justin Bieber even who, you know, gets discovered on, on YouTube or whatever, but he's proven that he's worth it. And uh, that's the way it's going to be. So. Right. And as you say, you know, all these different platforms, Spotify, you mentioned, you see what they did with Rogan last week, dude. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, it, I mean that's, it's wild, you know, I mean, I never would have imagined this and I've been asked to do a podcast, which again, like, like doing other entourages, I guess I was stupid. Five years, people been like doing a podcast. I'm like, what the hell is a podcast? Mm. And now everyone I know from my dentist to my lawyer, you know, they have podcasts. So <laughs> it, there is a glut and it's going to be tricky to, to find your way in. Yeah. Well, hey, listen, it is great to talk to you. Thank you very much for all the time today. Uh, let's make sure we do this again. And uh, good luck with Gary Busey later today. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. Appreciate <laughs> you, pal. Thanks, Doug. I, li I like the t-shirt, dude. Hey, in the meantime, I, I, wa I, I followed yesterday. I followed John Rahm yesterday on the golf course here. So right. I, watched, I watched him play. He was playing 54 holes. I watched him play like nine holes. He was getting done today so he could go over to Rancho Santa Fe Country Club where he could play with Phil today. And uh, yeah, I mean, nice. dude, this guy, what a machine this dude is. By the way, Phil is like, I played, you know, I play this game pickleball I'm obsessed with. I see and, that. Uh, you know what that is? Yeah, of course. So it's like mini tennis. And I play with like, you know, professional tennis players and stuff. So it's like for a slow Jew, I can like get into a sport where I can actually compete with these guys. But the first time I ever played was with left and Phil Mickelson, you know, um, yeah. And, and Phil, you know, he's just an athlete at everything. But we played in the desert at the, at the Madison Club. It was 105 degrees. We played for like two hours. I thought I was having a stroke. I sat by the pool, and then I see Phil by himself. He played 36 holes by himself. It must have been 111 degrees. Jeez. And, and that's the thing we are talking about earlier. Like, when you're committed to, to greatness, you know, and you have the talent also, that's what you got to do. So, Dude, my boy Andrew, and I know your boy too, there is – there. There's just nothing like this human being. I mean, no. force of nature. I mean, I, and, and, you know, these guys, I show these guys pictures at his party, uh, at Steph's party a few months back. Well, I guess this is not just a few months back. And, uh, and we had those Popeye sandwiches that night because we have an ongoing debate here about Popeye's versus Chick-fil-A. There ain't no debate. There ain't no debate. Uh, Popeye's, Popeye's got the better sandwich. Popeye's, 100%. Thank yeah. you. And just I, don't know which, I don't know which is healthier. Popeye's is better. Juicier, better. Easy. See, Popeye's, now that would be... By the way, I'm not... By the way, I'm not stabbing anybody for either, but but Popeyes is better. <laughs> Speak for yourself. Speak for yourself. <laughs> All right, Doug. We'll talk next time, brother. Thanks Appreciate a lot. it. Man. Appreciate it. Take Thanks, care, Doug. Yeah, you too. Okay, thank you, Doug Allen. I, dude, I love that. I really love that. Um, as soon as we were done, I texted Doug and my friend Andrew, who, whose name you heard there, and said, "What a great job!" And he's like, "Great." And now I want to watch and I want to listen. Now. I don't know if you picked up on this, Alex, because you picked up on a lot of the entourage stuff in Doug's world. Mm -hmm. He mentioned our common BFF, my mm -hmm. friend Andrew left. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember or not. There was a, a time where Ari Gold says on entourage, fuck Andy left. You know, like, I'll fucking kick his fucking ass. Andy left. Fuck him. Because Andy left was another agent stealing a client. I think it was, you know, okay. he was stealing. He was stealing I don't remember that. Yeah, but that, of course, why would you? I mean, it was a very subtle very small, yeah. nuance to the show. But when I saw it, I was like, OMG, yeah. no, he didn't. Yeah, I had, so, a, I had a million more entourage questions, but I didn't want to fanboy in front of you guys. So I just decided to let, let, it, let it proceed as, as it went, yeah. as it went. Hey, Browner, I was impressed that uh, you had in your repertoire there, Fat Beach. Dude, I actually saw Fat Beach in the 90s, man. It was like a, it was, it was a hood classic, as they say. Now, I didn't know that people said that he was uh, racially playing around with that movie, which I, I guess at the time, I didn't see it that way. But as 38-year-old me, yeah, maybe. <laughs> well, I think he said, you know, even with Entourage, you know, you go back. I don't remember what year the show started, but you go back to the it's beginning like of Entourage. 03, 04. Right. So now a lot of the things that were said back then are not so politically correct now. You know, right. I hadn't even considered that. I hate that shit, story. dude. I've seen a lot of things about that, like how how I met your mother, friends, shows like that, like that just things don't hold up. It's like, yeah, but like in the time 
it did. So let it go. Like you can't cancel a show that's already done. Right. You know? like if, if, what are the, what's the name? Like Nickelodeon? Is that no? Not Nickelodeon. Yeah. What, what's the name of like those those networks where they show old TV shows? The not, TV network. Yeah. Okay. Whatever it is. Like I'll watch Sanford and Son today. I'll watch the Jeffersons today. There's a lot of off color comedy in those shows, both black and white. I mean, if you put on. Uh, you know, leave it to Beaver, which was as white and as um, as pristine as could be. I might still watch that, but if you put on Archie Bunker and All in the Family, I accept the fact that it was you know back in the '70s where you said certain things about certain people. That's the way it was. That's why it's not like that anymore. I think All in the Family and San Francisco are two of the greatest shows to ever be on television, and you should be able to watch those at any point in time because what they're trying to show you is the extremism and why you shouldn't be that way. Well, and plus, you know, like people like when they the guys are getting shit on for like just hitting on women and like just like hooking up with them and then never talking again, dude. That, that that's the world that actors live in. You know right. what I'm saying? Like that that happens still today. It's a world, it's a world where men live in. Okay, <laughs> go to a bar, hook up with, and a it's dick, also a world that women live about. in because right. women also do the same shit. Yeah, sometimes they don't want to. Too. Sometimes they don't want to call you back, bro. Sometimes yeah. they're just not gonna call you back. Hey, you know, speaking of, um, of of like all in the family and, and being able to see shows like that, one of the big national debates that's happening today, I love this. Alex, you could maybe screen share with us because um, I, I didn't plan on this, but you guys see the story today about um, how, how Trump has been sending out these tweets about this guy, Joe Scarborough from MSNBC. <laughs> and he's who's, like, he, who's, he's, who's he picking on today? Well, he's picking God. on this guy, Joe This Scarborough. is all weekend, dude. This is all weekend. But, but anyway, to make a long story short, you know, here's Trump in the middle of the Corona pandemic. It's in over. the middle, I, Well, I know now. Now it is. You've declared it such. Um, in the middle of this economic thing, even though the stock market's been on fire here. Um, here's Trump bullying on Twitter, this guy, Joe Scarborough. And and without going, John, maybe you fill in the blank. Who's Joe Scarborough? Here. Joe Scarborough. Okay, so Joe Scarborough is a host of something on MSNBC called Morning Joe. He hosts a show with him and Minka Przinsky. Oh who, yeah, they make fun Donald of Donald Trump yeah. all the time. Donald Trump says she's got blood coming out of here, there, her, wherever. And so now he's basically saying that Joe Joe Scarborough murdered someone. Yeah, like it's like a Carol Baskin kind of a story. Yes, you yes, know. And so yes. so anyway, so so Trump is accusing a television host of, of and calling him psycho. And, mm -hmm. call, and so anyway, so he's bullying this guy, you know? And by the way, I'm sure the ratings are going through the roof for Joe Scarborough. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure he'll take it. But anyway, Trump is saying all these terrible things about this guy and, and accusing him of murder, et cetera. And people are saying, in fact, the, the widow of the person who was murdered said to Jack Dorsey, the, the CEO of Twitter, please take down Trump's tweets. And this is the debate that I wrote on Sided today. So Dorsey and Twitter have refused to take down these tweets. I, th okay? I thought they couldn't take down his tweets because it's historical record. They're official presidential declarations. Right. Well, for whatever reason they have for not taking down his tweets, I concur 1000%. Look, this is the president of the United States of America. No one person or one company should censor the president of the United States of America, even if he is being a giant mm. bully or a big bag of wind. And here's why I say that, because let the words be the reflection of the man. He said it, he put it on Twitter, whether he said it with words coming out of his mouth or words being typed by his fingers, whatever it is that he said, let the words be the reflection of the man who said them. And so look, Here's what I'm saying. If Donald Trump posted some crazy outlandish shit on Sided, I'd do what Jack Dorsey has been doing this whole time, which is celebrating that. Because if you're not going to take down Donald Trump's tweets today when he's bullying a TV host, a public figure, you know the amazing, terrible things that he has said about individuals, about companies, terribly damaging things about companies. I mean, just think about the media alone, the things he says about CNN, the things he says about the New York Times. I mean, these are damaging comments to big branded media companies. Listen, if you don't take down that kind of stuff and you just let it go because you're hiding behind he's the president, it's by record and whatever else, or hiding behind he's a newsworthy figure. Because let me tell you something, people get kicked off Twitter for a lot less than what Trump says. 
So bottom line, here's my bottom line. I agree with Dorsey. My, I agree that you let his words reflect on him and you don't take them down. Alex, I don't know if you can put this up on the screen or maybe. Already added up. Okay. While Trump is acting like a bully, what's new? Jack Dorsey has made the right decision to not take down Donald Trump's tweets. Browner, you should get on to side it and come get some because I'm spending this whole week trying to take down the three-time defending champion, Bernard Thompson. And early in the week, the man is already putting a beating to me because he's up by 100 points on the leaderboard. I'm writing more debates. I'm in more uh, debates. And I'm asking everybody to come vote on all of my arguments because I want to beat Bernard this week. And now, Browner, you should be involved because there's a guy who stole your name and he's on the leaderboard. <laughs> put this back up on the screen. The number two person on the leaderboard right now is lay up on a fool. You're dunk on a fool. He's lay up on a fool. You need to get in the game, sucker. Listen, man. All businesses should have the right of refusal. And I will not refuse to block the hell out of lay up on the fool. Because if you can't come with force, then you shouldn't come at all. But shout out to him. All right. Let also, me, I got also also I got the hottest debate on Cider right now, and I ain't even write it. Shout out to my dog Toby. Talk to me, Toby. Listen, who would you want to rather be for a day? Is Tom Brady in there? I think it's like some famous soccer player in there. I'm on there, but I'm at the end. Me and other, but I'm winning this debate. I'm up fifty three percent. So shout out, man. Shout out to all the folks. The debate was uh, if you had to be one guy for a day, and ladies, if you mm -hmm. could have your man be one guy for a day, it was That's like right, ladies. Who else was on that list? You had like Brad Pitt, yeah, Tom Brady, yeah, um, David Beckham, yeah, Mark Wahlberg. We just Michael Jordan. I thought yeah. Michael Jordan was on there too. And then the end of it was John Browner or awesome. other. And fifty-two percent say John Browner or other. Now I don't know if that means John Browner. Wait, he put you as other. he put you as John Browner slash other. Yeah. So. That's not a vote for you. That First could be a all, vote for I knew, others. I, I knew you was going to do this. I knew you was going to do this. I knew you was going to. You're such a hater. There's a reason you why your screen's do... pixelating right now because you're lying. Oh, no. Slash no, no, other. No, no, no. Pixel God in the building. All you got to do is What's go to them, go to them comments and you'll see, I'd rather be browner. I'd rather be browner. People typed my name in there. Okay? So that's how I know I got the edge. How many burners you got on, on site? Man, your business. How about that? <laughs> Burners right, go burn. Let me do this. Let me get to Grande Alejandro. He is standing by with the highlight of the day, man, presented by Tori Holistics. And now he's going to tell you how you can save 20% on your next purchase, whatever it may be, THC, CBD, beverages, whatever. Here's Grande. It's time for the highlight of the day, man. Do you want to get high, man? I'm just really... Hi. Highlight of the day brought to you by Tori Holistics. You guys know the rules. Go to skybr.com. It looks different now. That's right. It looks like this. All you got to do is scroll to the Tory Holistics banner. You click on it and it takes you here. Same old great page with the promo code GRANDE. Minimum $75 purchase. You get 20% off your next order at Tory Holistics. Make sure you use this promo code GRANDE. 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 Grande, grande, <laughs> grande, 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 grande. All right. Not everybody is as busy as Scott Kaplan during the stay at home lockdown. <laughs> people are getting bored. A lot of people are getting bored, including this guy named Creasy, because he has a channel on YouTube called Swish Online. And Homeboy did a 70 part trick shot. And what does that mean? It means that this trick shot had 70 different components before the ball went in the basket. This video takes about four minutes to play, but I condensed it down to about 20 seconds because I fast forwarded it. Here it is, the highlight of the day by the Swish Machine. A 70 part trick shot, and I'm playing it right now. Dude. I sped it all up, dude. As I was watching this, I went, man, this guy must live in the country. Cause this right. this thing was going and going and going and going and knocking more stuff down, going up, going down. Damn, bro. You know what I thought of when I saw this shot? This guy needs to throw some shit away, dude. Yeah, me too. Like he's a hoarder. He's a hoarder, dude. <laughs> so, yeah, this much shit laying around your house. There's a lot of stuff, oh and God. the trick shot's not even that cool. It just it's goes just in long. the basket. Yeah, <laughs> it was long, dude. 
How long did it take him to do that? I would be much more interested in seeing how many times this guy failed. Oh, like how, yeah. how many times did that basketball roll down the trail at the end and not go in the hoop? Oh. I would love to see that video. Dude, um, that is, unless you tell me, and maybe I, I don't know this, unless you tell me he's printing money on YouTube, wow, that guy got a lot of freaking time, man. I told you, not everybody is like you, dude. I've, I, could, I could attest to that. Not everybody's busy. People are bored. Hey, man, man, look, that brother, that brother's a TMT all-star. Too much time. On <laughs> All right, Grande, there you go. There's your highlight of the day, man, presented by Tori Holistics, where you can save 20% by using our promo code Grande. Just go to our website, scottandbr.com, and click on the Tori Holistics link. Take it in, show it to them, or use it online. Save your 20%. John Browner. Talk to me. When people say, what is you doing? I think of, like, the San Diego Chargers of Los Angeles. What is you doing telling the world that the reason you can't sell PSLs and the reason you can't sell tickets is the after effects of COVID-19? COVID-19, if co let me say this. Let me just say it like this. What if, is happening, right? If, if no one in the world ever heard of coronavirus, the Chargers ticket sales would be exactly the same today as they are corona, no corona. Do you understand what I'm saying? Or, or possibly worse. There's, there, I'm just telling you right now to blame coronavirus on your poor sales, which is why the Rams then had to go to the NFL and ask for a big loan and more time to pay it off. Okay. The, the, the reason that the Rams did that and got that is because of the Chargers failures and the Chargers failures, which they say are corona related are not. So that's what I think of when I think of what is you doing, but it's your bit. So I'll just say. What is you doing? What is what is you doing? What are you what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? What is you doing? Uh uh. Shout out to the pixel god in the building. Look, I gotta tell y'all, man, Memorial Day was very different. It was very special. America, you opened back up and you was beautiful. But man, some of y'all got to go back inside because look, brothers, it's hard <laughs> for us out here as it is. We got Karen's calling the police on us in Central Park because she don't want to put her dog on a leash. We got another brother that got stumped out to death by a police officer. I think it was in Minnesota either yesterday or today. And now you mean to tell me that there are black men in San Diego, California playing with knives in the park. I had. And, I, and axes. Knives and axes. There's some things that you see them and you don't believe them and you need to talk to the person who reported that video. So when I saw Alex post this video, I had to go, hey, man, what the hell was that? Play this video, Alex. I've been playing it. Brother, put them goddamn knives down, man. Unless you want to become a statistic, bro. Put them shits away. You, you, you out there topless? You, you, you auditioned for Game of Thrones remake? What are you doing with these knives, man? You going to the fucking circus, brother? Ain't no more circus. Put that shit away. You could get killed. What, you a sushi chef? What, what's going on with these knives and these hatchets, man? Black people don't play with knives like this. What, what's wrong with you? If you had a spear, you used to a spear, you, I can get with that. That's in your DNA. That's in your heritage, brother. But these knives and these axes, leave that for these white people, okay? Stop. <laughs> Stop it. Please. All right. What is you uh, doing? <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's my question. Alex, you're, question? you're sitting there at the park. Yeah. See a black man wielding knives. Losing his mm -hmm. mind. Shirtless and and ripped. Does and out of shape somehow. Does it does it ever occur to you to walk up to him and say, excuse me, brother? No. Hell no. Excuse me, brother. Come here. Let me let me let me have a couple of words with you, man. Hey man, uh look at here. A uh, wow. black man in a park. Oh, I'm trying to I'm trying to bro down with this guy, you know. Oh but that's you saying me coming up to. I don't talk. You don't well, talk like that at all. This, this, this the way this is the way I would talk. I'd be like, yo, hey, excuse me, brother, come over here a second. Wait, this is the way you would talk as Alex. Yeah. Uh, right. Oh God. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. Said, Look at here, man. I say, uh, let me ask you a question. Oh God. What is you doing? What, what, what black man in a park with knives and axes, brother? You about to become a statistic? Why are you doing this? And, and I'd try and play it like that because what I'd be trying to do is hopefully he'd be like, you know, man, maybe you're right. Maybe I should get out of here and not be doing this. Because what I'm really trying to say is I'm feeling a little unsafe right now. Okay. Because <laughs> yeah. the thing is he got these weapons 
And if all of a sudden he goes crazy in his mind, like, look at these people, how dare they be social distancing? Did you ever think like he may want to cut us up? Right. So I'll, I'll just talk you through it because my first, oh my God, my first reaction, I swear to you was there's hidden cameras somewhere. And they're recording people's reactions. I don't know why I thought that. That was the first thing I fucking thought. I was like, all right, I'm going to come out with some fucking crank ink or shit or something. But that was my first thought. My second thought was then, those are really sharp knives <laughs> that he has over there. Like, I, because I was close to him. I was a solid 20, 25 feet away from him. And I was like, those are pretty sharp. And it's a little weird. And he has an axe, so he can throw that thing. And then my third thought was, am I faster than anybody else around here to get away? <laughs> and I said yes, because I looked around. And I was like, okay, I'm going to run towards that person. Oh my God. Because if anything, I'm faster than that person. Uh, and then that was it, dude. Like, honestly, I just didn't even think about it after a while. And nobody did. Like, nobody called the cops on him. Um, nobody bothered him. I don't think anybody – nobody fucking went up to him. That's for sure. Um, but it looked more of a joke than anything. And I, I'm sorry if that guy's like some professional, like – medieval times role player or something but it didn't look that great I, I that's why i thought it was funny i'm a browner on this brother what his is your skills doing? were off dude yeah dude i'm like brother what is you doing man seriously i don't care black or white i don't care if, if he's if he if he's asian and he looks like he's a ninja i'd be like you know he knows what he looks like he, he knows what he can do but i don't think a public park is a place to be swinging knives and axes i see some people that you know go and they practice their their moves and stuff in the middle of a park by the way, this is practicing moves. What you guys are looking at right here is practicing moves, but but that not with knives. Little, little capoeira. I don't know what it is, but with knives, dude, that just looks dangerous, and um, I just don't think I'd feel very comfortable. I'd have to go to a different park. Yeah, well, what, I did. What did well, Browner's frozen right now, so we could just oh. wrap today's show right. up because right. I don't know what it, we lost. Yeah, him. we lost him. But look at his look. If you show his frozen face, he looks so cute. Look at his, look at his frozen face. Oh, he. he his face is saying what is, oh, it's gone now. But his face was saying, <laughs> what, what is he doing? doing? <laughs> what is he doing? All right. Uh, thank, let's go. All right. Thank you to Corky's Pest Control, 1 800 911 102. Yeah, we know. Thank nah, you. Too late. Yeah, well, you're done. Thank you to Mountain Trust <laughs> Mortgage and Realty Services, 858 376 1299. Thank you to Tory Holistics. You'll save 20% by using our promo code Grande. Shout outs to Total T Clinic. I need a shot in this ass and a beat 12 in this ass. Rock the line towards tobyrockandline.com. SMSglobal.com, our texting partners. You're going to get your text and then you're going to click on the link and you're going to be part text. of the show. And coastcarepartners.com, where if you're looking for a new job in healthcare in particular, maybe that's not for you right now, but for some of you it is, risk takers, coastcarepartners.com. Use our referral code, great friends. Uh, Doug Allen, awesome dude. Awesome Solid. interview. Really loved it. Part one of a 10 part series now with Doug Allen. Ask him for Gary Busey's email address. That's a good idea. A very good idea. Let's see. If we Did can... I miss anything? Uh, or yeah. the whole cast. We should ask him for the whole cast email. Not a bad idea either. Started interviewing dudes from Entourage. Okay. Until manana, stay healthy out there, everybody. Peace.